The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. So there's a Jew, he's 94 years old or 95 years old today, he lives in Petach Tikva, and his name is Rabbi Yaakov Frank. And he shared the story, I heard him tell the story. Rabbi Yaakov Frank was born in August 1929. His grandfather, Rabbi Tzvi Pesach Frank, was the chief rabbi of Jerusalem after Rav Cook passed away in 1935. Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank became the great, great Rav of Yerushalayim for many decades. He was a great Talmud Chachem, he was a brilliant scholar, but his heart equaled and matched his mind. He was a, a loving, humble, beautiful person. Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank, known as the Har Tzvi, very special man. He lived not far from him. Rabbi Pesach Frank had a grandson who was born <coughs> in Chaydish Av after Tisha B'Av, Tafresh Pei 1929. His bris was the next Shabbos. Rabbi Pesach Frank had to be that Shabbos in Hebron for a Sheva Brachis of his family. But because his son had a baby, daughter and a baby, and he would be the Sandik at the bris, so he stayed back in Jerusalem. That Shabbos was the Hebron massacre, 60, 17th of Av, 18th of Av, 69, 69 Jews were axed to death by the Arab terrorists. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank and his wife were both saved because they stayed behind in Yerushalayim for the bris of this boy, would be named Yaakov Frank, who lives in Petach Tikva today, La Riches Yom and Davis. 94 years old, 1929, 94. 24 of the Jews murdered were students of Yeshiva's Hevron, Slabotka. Reb Nossin Svi Finkel came in the 1920s from Lithuania and built a Yeshiva in Hevron. Knesset Yisrael, Hevron, Slabotki, Yeshiva. 24 of the Jews murdered were Yeshiva students, young boys, who were killed. One of them, a few of them were American. One of them was an American boy. And in America in the 20s, there were no Yeshivas. Tari Vadas would open a little later. Yeshiva University would open then. But there was no infrastructure of Yeshivas. And he was a brilliant young man and he wanted to learn. So he asked his parents if he can go to Israel, Palestine. And they agreed, and he went to learn in Hebron. <coughs> he was from Philadelphia, and he did amazingly well. In 1929, things got very, very chaotic here. There were riots, and the parents were worried for their son. So they sent a telegram to the Rosh Hashiva. <coughs> Excuse me. And they asked if their son could come back. They want him back. <coughs> the Rosh Hashiva asked Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank to intervene. And he said, since you have connections with communities in America, because everyone used to ask him questions in, in writing, do you know the rabbi of that shul in Philadelphia? Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank said, yeah. So he said, could you write him a letter? And tell him that in Hebron everything is safe. Because one of the leaders of Hebron was Rebbe Leazar Dan Slonim. He was on the council of Hebron. He was a banker. He spoke Arabic. He was very close with the Arabs. So the Jews of Hebron felt protected. In fact, when the pogrom started, they all went to his house. He had a gun. They davened there. And then somebody took away his gun and he was murdered. His wife was murdered. And all the Jews in his house were murdered during Shachris. But Hebron is safe. Because Rosh Hashiva said, Rosh Hashiva said to lose this boy, going back to America, we're going to lose him. And he's a budding diamond. He's a budding leader. He's charismatic and creative and wise. And we need, we need these types of leaders. So Rabbi Pesach Frank acquiesced and he sent a message to the rabbi in Philadelphia. Please tell the parents, Hebron is safe. They shouldn't take their boy home. And they listened. And the boy stayed in Hebron, and he was murdered. And Rabbi Pesach Frank could not forgive himself. He felt 
that literally he mixed in and he was indirectly guilty. The parents were worried. They wanted to bring this boy home. He convinced them not to bring him home and the boy was murdered. Which means he felt he had blood on his hands. It was indirectly obviously and it was non-deliberate but he felt ultimately why did he mix in when he did not know the situation and why did he give such advice. And he could not forgive himself. Now he wouldn't talk a lot about it but his grandson Yaakov whom because of his bris, Reb Pesach was saved, with him he shared the story. He said, you know, I was saved because of your bris, and this boy, I caused his murder. And he could never ever forgive himself. Years passed. Reb Yaakov Frank told the story. It's 1960. That's 30 years. The massacre was 29. So this is 31 years after the Hebron pogrom. And he's in Miluyim. He goes to the IDF, he's already 30 years old, 31 years old, and he's a reservist in the IDF, 1960. And they're in training, they're doing imunim. And one night, it was a Wednesday night, they were somewhere in a field doing training, and it started to pour. And they went into the trenches, but the water was so powerful, the downpour was so intense, that the trenches filled up with water. And they were there for hours, soaking and in the trench that he went in, there was another man, also a reservist, who went into the same trench. So now they're both soaked. The floods are coming down. They're drenched to the core of their bones. They're freezing. But they're there in the middle of the night in some place. So you start talking to each other. Shalom Aleichem. What's your name? What's your name? Yaakov Frank. Yaakov Frank, grandson of Rapsi Pei. You know Jewish geography. The great Kabbalist Jackie Mason. He's the guy who repeated my jokes. So Jackie Mason once said, if two Jews meet, then within three minutes they don't establish a family connection. One of them is not Jewish. <laughs> so he says, uh, Yaakov Frank, yeah, you're the grandson of Sipesach Frank. He says, yeah. So he says to him, wow, how is your grandfather doing? He's great. And they're talking, what do you do? He says, I'm a historian of the Yishuv HaYehudi Be'eretz Yisrael Lifnei Kum HaMedina. I'm a historian of the Yishuv in Israel before the state was established in 48. So he starts talking about the Hebron pogrom and how he saved his grandfather because he was a Sandik at his bris. And then he tells him, you know, but my grandfather is still broken hearted because of that Slabotke Hebron boy who was murdered. So this historian looks at him, they're in the trenches. And he says, do you know the end of the story? He says, what end of the story? The boy was dead. The boy was killed. What's the end of the story? He says, you know, there's another part to the story. He says, I never knew. So he says, well, this father, the father of the boy who was slain, was a big macher in Philadelphia. He was a diplomat, and he was very close to many politicians in the State Department. And he made a ruckus. He went to the State Department, and he says, it's the British who are guilty. Because how did they stop the Hebron pogrom? The British came, and they shot. And the rioters left, because the rioters didn't have live ammunition. They used knives, they used, they used hatchets, they used axes. And when the British started to shoot, they all ran away. Why couldn't the British shoot early Shabbos morning? Why couldn't they shoot Friday night? They let it happen. They were accomplices to the murder of these Jews. And he made such a commotion in the State Department, they put pressure on the British, and they replaced the commander of the British presence, the British mandate, the one in charge, and they sent a military man by the name of Arthur Wakoff. He was sent by the British to replace the leader of the British, uh, the British authority mandate here in Palestine, Arthur Wakoff. And the man says to Yaakov Frank, Arthur Wakoff started to travel the land. Thank you. And when he, started to, when he started to travel the land, he fell in love with Israel. He fell in love with them. And he liked, he liked the Jewish people. And he came here in 1931. And his tenure continued to 1937. And during his tenure, he opened up the gates. And he allowed anyone who wanted to immigrate to Israel. And because of that, close to 400,000 Jews could come here. In fact, because of him, he says, when Hitler rose to power in Germany in 1933, many German Jews and Austrian Jews could come here. And many other Jews from Eastern Europe made Aliyah because he opened the doors. And not only that, he quadrupled 
the ability of Jews to own territory, to own assets, to own ground and earth in Israel, almost five times the amount, and he almost quadrupled the number of Jews living in Israel. When he came here, there were around 150,000 Jews. And then when he was done in 1937, he was gone officially because of an illness. So he was fired, whatever it is. The number was much, much higher. And he looks at Yaakov Frank. He says, I just want you to realize one thing. In 1948, during the Independence War, there were 600,000 Jews here. One percent of them were killed. 6,000 Jews were killed in the War of Independence. But if not for Arthur Wakov, there wouldn't have been 600,000 Jews. There would have been much, much, much less. And there was no way, naturally, they could win any war. So just realize that despite the horrible, horrible tragedy, that story caused Arthur Wakov to come to Israel. And because of that, today, today they can build a country of Israel and 200,000 Jews were saved from Auschwitz because they could come here during those years. So we don't know why that boy was killed, but we should just realize that the whole Israel and hundreds of thousands of Jews owe their life to that boy because of what happened. Yaakov Frank was stunned. It's 1960. He said, my grandfather never heard the end of the story. Nobody ever told this to him. Nobody knew it. I have to tell this to him. He says, go ahead. At that point, it was three in the morning. And the commander said, listen, this training is not going anywhere because this rain is not stopping. You can all go home. <laughs> you have an early chafesh, sof shavua, go home. And they're drenched. They say, baruch shepatrani, they go home. He comes home. Exhausted, he was tired. He tells his wife, Yaakov tells his wife, they had a baby. He tells his wife, Anino Seya Miyad Saba. I'm going right away to Saba, to Ripsi Pesach Frank. She says, You go visit him every Shabbos. Every Shabbos after davening, he walked an hour and a half to go visit his grandfather. He says, No, I have to go now. I said, What do you have to go? I have to tell him something. She says, Go. He comes Thursday to his grandfather. Ripsi Pesach Frank greets him. And says, I thought you were in Sahal. What happened? So he tells him the story. They were soaked and the commander said they can go home. And I wanted to come here. He says, why do you have to come here? You're coming Shabbos anyway. He said, I have to tell you something. He says, what do you want to tell me? Before you tell me, first a cup of tea. He puts up the kettle. He gives himself and his grandson a cup of tea. He says, Yaakov, tisaper. And he tells his, grand, his grandfather the whole story of what he just heard in the trenches about the consequences of the death of that boy and how it changed history in Israel. So Pesach listens and he says, wow, I never knew this. Literally, you just took a stone that was on my chest for 31 years and you removed it. And he said, you know, I'll never forgive myself for what I did, but I realized that there's things I just don't know. And stories have continuations in ways that people don't know. And he thanks him, and he walks him to the door, and he says, I want to tell you something. You didn't have to bother and leave your wife and child when you're anyway coming for Shabbos. You didn't have to. But I will never be able to thank you enough for the fact that you rushed right over here and you told the rest of the story. And he escorted him out, he gave him a kiss, and he said shalom, and he left. Shabbos morning, this was his custom every Shabbos morning, Yaakov Frank finished davening, and then he walked an hour and a half to go to visit his Saba and say Shabbat shalom. On the way, he passed his brother-in-law's house, his brother-in-law comes out and says, you don't have to go. He says, why not? He says, Saba passed away. Shabbos, 8 o'clock in the morning, it was Shabbos told us, Chaf Aleph Kislev. Chaf Aleph Kislev, Tovshin Chaf Aleph. December 1960, Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank passed away suddenly at the age of 87. This week is his yard site. And he just passed away two hours ago. There's nowhere to go. Yaakov Frank was stunned. The next day was the funeral. Mitzvah Shabbos was the funeral. 1977. There's a mahapecha, there's a revolution in the Israeli government. For the first time, it goes from the left to the right, and Menachem Begin becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. 
Some of you may even remember it. Till then, Israel belonged to the left. Menachem Begin, who was always in the opposition, became the Prime Minister of Israel. Who did he hire? And as one of his people was Yaakov Frank. And he was in charge of helping build the territories in Yehuda and Shamron. Menachem Begin sent him to the United States of America to do some work on this behalf of the Jews living in those areas and building up the Shtachim. And in the process, he told him to go visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So in 1977, Yaakov Frank came to visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe in Brooklyn. He went in, he introduced himself. The Rebbe asked him, of course, the Jewish question, are you related to Rebbe Tzvi Pesach Frank? And he said, I'm his grandfather. And he said, the Rebbe looked at him and said, Tisaperli al Saba, tell me stories about your grandfather. So he told the Lubavitcher Rebbe about his grandfather. And the Rebbe says, Otsipur, tell me another story. Told him another story, Otsipur. Kept on asking him for more stories. And finally he said, and tell me one more story. <laughs> so he decided to tell this story. And he told this story. The Rebbe listened. And when he finished, the Rebbe looked at him and he said, I want to tell you something. I always tell my students, and I always tell anybody who listens to me, that when you have an opportunity to do something good, don't delay it. Because mimanavshach, any way you look at it, it doesn't make sense to delay it. If it's something that's not worth doing, then you shouldn't do it even in six months. And if it's something that's worthwhile doing, then do it today. Don't do it tomorrow. Don't do it in two hours. Do it now and do it today. And he says, look, if you would have waited for Shabbos, to tell your grandfather this story, you would have never forgiven yourself. You would have never forgiven yourself. And your grandfather would go to the next world with this heaviness. Because you had the conviction. To go now and go right now. So look what happened. Your grandfather died that Shabbos morning a day later with a sense of peace. And you had that sense of peace. How grateful you are to yourself for doing that. He said, look at this lesson. When there's something good to do, do it now. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. StoriesToInspire.org